He came here looking for the promised land. He didn't find it. He was going to do everything that he could to make that happen, uh, not just for himself, but for his people and for other people as well. The vision for media in the hands of African Americans is what he was looking for. Hi, Lou, how are you doing? I'm great. Okay, today, you know, I really want to have a conversation with you focused on your life, KBBG, and the man from Mississippi, Jimmy Porter. So, welcome to this, this time for us to have a conversation. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm just pleased to, to be here. You know, I've always admired your energy, uh, focus, and sense of responsibility as you have shared the leadership of KBBG-FM. And when I think about you, Lou, with all of this energy, I'm always curious about where it's come from. Can you take a moment to please tell us about your background and the source of your strength? Aaron, I was extremely um, fortunate and blessed to have a family, uh, to have a mother and a father who cared who uh, raised us. There were three boys and five girls. Um, they always had high expectations for us, um, would not take any less, uh, never allowed us to uh, blame someone else for our failures, always told us that we could be anything we wanted to be, to never allow anyone to define who we are. And so by the time we got all these lessons, and it, it wasn't even so much lessons that they told us about orally, but they lived what they were teaching mm -hmm. us. And I think that that's the greatest thing um, that can happen to a child. Of course, the family was important, and I'm hearing all of these messages that were coming. Where were you? I mean, uh, was it important in terms of the town you grew up in? Tell us about that area. I grew up in a, um, a black and Mexican-American neighborhood. In and Galesburg. so in Galesburg, okay. yes, and and it, it's still partly that part of town is still has has that uh, makeup, but um, our folks realized that there were going to be obstacles and that they wanted us to know who we were and we didn't want for one thing, uh, my brothers were taught always look a person. All of us were taught always yeah. look a person in the eye. When we were growing up, our parents were just simply able to tell us and to instill in us the work ethic, a sense of fairness, a sense that we owed something for being on this earth, that we were our brother's keeper. I mean, the messages just kept coming and okay. just kept coming and were reinforced by how they lived it. Not how they said it, but how they actually lived. So they were role models for you, pretty much. Uh, I, as I listen to you, I'm getting excited saying, boy, I wish I was in that family. <laughs> But uh, if you had to reduce uh, all of that learning down to just a few words uh, uh, or words that would come to mind that would best describe the lessons of your youth that guide you today, what might those words be? I think it would be learn to be steadfast. Well, what experiences led you from Galesburg to Washington to Waterloo to the communications industry. Over Jordan, we would always listen to that. We would listen to um, um, sermons mm -hmm. on the radio. Mm -hmm. Who would ever think that in my lifetime, I would have a up close and personal experience with the vehicle that brought those messages to us? And you're saying that, boy, you know, I was given opportunities that were shaping a career mm -hmm. that I didn't really realize were being shaped. So just the, the family and yeah. the radio, and mm -hmm. were there other experiences with writing or speaking or anything? Because, you know, you're a wonderful speaker. Well, believe me, it was none of those, really. I didn't have the, the experience that we had uh, with our parents again was both my mother and my father, okay. who came from Tennessee and Kentucky, had an eighth grade education. And so we were, again, very fortunate in the fact that we had magazines in our house. Okay. Uh, it was not unusual to see uh, my mother and my father to read. They had these chairs, okay. they would sit down and they would yeah. read the Bible. 
Uh, it was not unusual to hear prayer in, in our house. Uh, we were told, I think from the time we were small, you have to get an education. You have to get an education. Okay. And, and all of us were, uh, wow. got through high school, some through college. What's happened today? Because you're still with those messages from your youth mm -hmm. as you look out and judge what's going on in society yes. today. But then all of a sudden, with no training, et cetera, you wind up uh, with the, the, the radio station. Mm -hmm. how, how did that happen? I mean, you, you come from Washington, D.C., where I'm sure they had radio, here to Waterloo, Iowa. And the next thing you know, KBBG. Tell me about that a little bit. Well, I've always been curious. And when we were leaving uh, Washington, D.C. and on our way to uh, Waterloo, Iowa, uh, someone said to me, are you the person who's going to Waterloo? Uh, yes, we are. Well, did you know that there's a black guy out there who's trying to start a radio station? And I said, well, he must be nuts. <laughs> I, I, can't, I couldn't even envision this, knowing that uh, the state of Iowa, we were less than 1%, mm -hmm. I think, 30-some mm -hmm. years ago. And so I'm thinking, how is this guy going to do this? I dream that Waterloo someday is going to be brought to the point where black people are going to be treated in such a way that they are not going to have to continue to be treated as underclass citizens. Every day, I am committed to resolving or attempting to destroy some of those things that are barriers to the betterment, not of only to myself, but they're also threatening to my children and my grandchildren. The Enabler Program is committed to finding ways and methods always and changing method as it becomes necessary to be able to deal with this system and this society that we live in. I want to meet this guy because I, I'm, I want to know where his head is at. How, how could he come up with this? Um, and I met Jimmy and, okay. and of course he wasn't a nut and I wound up married to Jimmy Porter <laughs> okay. and working with him for 30 some years in radio. Wow. Um, I, and he wasn't a radio person. None of us were. None of us okay. sitting around the table. The people that he convinced to come to the table under really circumstances that I don't think any of us really, really believe. We mm -hmm. wanted to believe. But people had had experiences that told them it's not going to work. It's just going to be another one of them things, and we're going to be blamed for it, and black people are going to be in worse shape than they've ever been. And this man is talking about a, a black radio station. Where is he going to get the money? Mm -hmm. Where is he going to get the support? And, of course, Jimmy, being visionary, he had looked way down the road. In fact, he had looked yeah. to where we are today and yes. knew that we would go down this Let's road. Let's talk about that visionary uh, uh, Jimmy Porter, the man from Mississippi. And, you know, it's, it's wonderful that we're sitting here in KBBG's uh, boardroom talking to you with Jimmy Porter smiling over our yes. shoulders, so to speak. Who was the man from Mississippi who came to be known as the beautiful black giant to some, and to others he became Daddy Porter. Tell yeah. us about Jimmy Porter. Well, we probably would never have enough time, but I will tell you Try. and share, okay. share with you a little bit of his childhood, mm -hmm. what I know and the circumstances. Uh, Jimmy was born in Mississippi, um, grew up, uh, and at a very young age went to the cotton fields. Uh, he left his mother at the age of eight years old with the decision that he made himself that had to do with uh, either his staying with his mother or having an opportunity to go live with a cousin of his. And how that came about, the cousin came to, to visit and Jimmy was in the yard and she says to him, oh, you're such a pretty little black boy, wouldn't you like to go home and, and, and live with me? Mm. And he says, go home and live with you. Would I be able to eat three meals a day and would I be allowed to go to school? And she says, yes. He said, I'll go. Go making that he decision. Made, he made that kind of he, questioning yes. a part of it. Food, yes. number one, and education. And education at eight years old. And the cousin went into the house and said to the mother, you have so many children. Would you let me take Jimmy with me? He wants to go. He wants to go to school. And that's how that happened. And then uh, went on and got through school 
at 17, he arrives in Waterloo, and uh, he had a brother here. And his, uh, he worked at John Deere, he worked at RAF, he got involved, uh, and this is many years later, mm -hmm. he got involved uh, with the union. Looked around in, in the community, and Jimmy was very active during the 60s and 70s. That's a whole other story by itself. But he was a community person, and um, a community person who really took to heart the cares and concerns of not only his own people, but of the human race, of people in general. Humanity was mm -hmm. important to him, and how they were treated, and how they were defined, and how they were related to by the greater society. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make sure that African Americans had the same respect that other people had. That commitment began in 1948, when a 17-year-old Jimmy Porter arrived in Waterloo. I came to Waterloo from Mississippi. I was looking for the promise to land. I uh, was disappointed because I found the land, but I discovered that the promise was even worse than where I came from. The thing that was of a shock to me was how well Waterloo had domesticated its black people. And it placed to have been a role that was almost, uh, to me, was insulting. And uh, and they had learned their place and was living within that place that had been designated to them by white people in Waterloo. In 1954, Jimmy Porter was laid off from his job at John Deere Company. From there, he went to work at Rath Packing House, where he became active in, and later vice president of, the United Packing House Workers Union a position he held until becoming a community enabler in 1968. In addition to being a union spokesman, Porter has also been a political activist. In 1972, he was an Iowa delegate for George McGovern. Beyond those responsibilities, Porter's dedication has been to civil rights, where he has had the vision to see the needs and the determination to find the solutions to problems plaguing blacks. But he becomes this super aware person in Waterloo, Iowa, and really taking in, like taking snapshots of the community and seeing what was wrong. But I don't know where that, that whole energy uh, really came from. I had invitations to the White House that he actually went there, then the president who was president at that time. Uh, but to see that he, he said when he came here, he found out. He came here looking for the promised land. You probably heard Jimmy say mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't find it. And because of that, I think it turned him a, a, at that point where he was going to do everything that he could to make that happen. Uh, not just for himself, but for his people and for other people as well. The vision for media in the hands of African Americans is what he was mm -hmm. looking for. Uh, thinking that a voice would give us a sense of achievement, a sense of empowerment, a sense of accomplishment. And certainly the empowerment was one of the things that he was greatly interested in and felt like through radio we could begin to make that happen. At that time, radio was the central focus in most African American homes throughout the country. You know, radio was a part of the culture. You know, it was a, not only the music, but it was the, uh, the dramas that were on radio. It was a source of news. And in many cities, uh, many folks had radio, but not necessarily television. He wanted blacks and well, African Americans mm -hmm. to be taken seriously mm -hmm. and not to be taken lightly. That's and right. he had this sense of social justice mm -hmm. that he felt was not being uh, demonstrated or, or not being realized in the black community. So the radio, mm -hmm. it, also, it became almost like this freedom train. We saw that as being a liberator of people here in Waterloo, Iowa. It, 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 have I captured that you, in a way, and what did I leave out? Yeah. You have captured it, and I think the, the thing that made Jimmy feel uh, so strongly about communications and mm -hmm. what it could do 
uh, for his people uh, was he was beginning to see something that he thought would be very dangerous to us as an African-American people. We're looking at it every day. We're looking at killings. Mm -hmm. We're looking at assaults. We're looking at robberies. We're looking at our young people dropping out of school. We're looking at a lack of respect for our parents, mm -hmm. for the women in our family. That had begun to filter in through music and magazines and other. Okay. And, and, and Jimmy was saying, we can get ahead of this train. And if we don't, using communications okay. and bringing people okay. in and discussing, and if we don't, his prediction was, if we don't, we would be where we are today. He saw the social ills that were being manifest at the time uh, being linked to media, yes. being linked directly to media mm -hmm. through the images and through the words and through the presentations Absolutely. that were going on. I want to step back before KBBG, though, because his activism led him to this uh, little house on Cottage Street. Uh, let's not forget that part because that seems to be a link between uh, his energy, his interest as a young man, his desire to do for the community, and then the establishment of KBBG. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, lest we forget, mm -hmm. let's talk about Cottage Street and his activism, what that led him to do, you know, being passionate about, you know, what's going on is one thing, but how did Jimmy actually organize his thinking mm -hmm. to, to actually take action? Because Waterloo was a troubled city in the yes. 60s. Yes. Yes. I think going back to Cottage Street and Jimmy somehow having the vision that one of the things that could help to turn this train around would be through media and all that that could mean. It would mean jobs, it would be training, uh, it would be giving a voice, it would, be, it would be saying to the greater community, we are really not mm -hmm. as different as it would appear. We really have more in common. We can use this media in order to bridge that gap okay. and come to the table and sit down. You know, when I think of President Barack Obama, this man came into office talking about, we've got to talk to people who previously we have not talked to. Mm -hmm. And so Jimmy is saying the same thing, that we need to be able to sit down and talk with each other. And we can disagree, but we need to be able to put our concerns on the table and come with, we've got to move from talking mm -hmm. to solution. He, he had to become an organizer in many Absolutely. ways. And so... I know in the 70s there was a national movement across the country, you know, following the riots of the 60s, et cetera, across the country. Uh, there were programs that started uh, that were labeled community enablers. Mm -hmm. How did, did Jimmy take part in that? Or? Jimmy was a community enabler for 27 years until he retired. Okay. And the United Methodist Church and the United Presbyterian Church in the very, very beginning uh, were the ones who provided funds and uh, really just took it on Jimmy's word because we didn't know anything about radio and the, the people that were sitting around the table uh, that somehow Jimmy got to believe, you know, let's come together and see what, okay. what we can do. He was always very, very active in the community and I think it is because of where he started from that he saw injustice. Okay. Jimmy told me that at a very young age he saw a person hung in the mm -hmm. South. And I think it had um, great meaning to him and, and left a great impact on him about um, our justice system, for, right. for instance. Right. Uh, the things that his mother had to go without to, to, to raise, there were 11 boys, four of them stillborn. Mm -hmm. uh, just that whole thing that he came from and knowing that as an eight-year-old that he could get out of this if he would follow a certain path. And he felt that if he could go to school and start his education, that that would be. And that's what led him step by step by step. And that's the reason he was such a, um, so devoted to education, right. for children to have education. You said that your backgrounds were very different. Very different. But I am seeing some, some stark similarities in that uh, your early upbringing uh, certainly left you with words and ideas that support you today and that inform your work today. Jimmy's early upbringing mm -hmm. certainly let, left him with visions 
and ideas that informed his work mm -hmm. uh, as he moved on to become a community enabler, right. to be a uniter, and then to move into uh, getting a, a, a radio station mm -hmm. established in Waterloo, mm -hmm. Iowa. Would his organizing work also take place, you know, or have any impact at Wrath at all? The whole idea that you could bring a people together and at least they would bring enough hope that they would be willing to try this man's mm -hmm. vision of a radio station and how it could be used, not just for then, mm -hmm. but for the future. He wasn't talking about starting something that would be gone in a year or five years yeah. or 10 years. Yeah. He's talking about wanting to establish an institution that will serve our people for the rest of our lives. Now, Jimmy Porter, the man, the man from Mississippi, the great black giant, Papa Porter to many, Daddy Porter to others, um, are there words that come to mind that really capture the essence of Jimmy Porter? If you had to say, this is the Jimmy Porter I knew, what would those words be? Integrity. This man had such great integrity. You weren't going to buy him off, pay him off. You weren't going to tell him who he was. Okay. Uh, you weren't going to uh, 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 rearrange his thoughts to be what mm -hmm. you thought they should be, which ties back into the radio station. Again, he is saying, have we not had enough of people telling us who we are, what we are, what we should say, when we should say it, how we should say it? Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. have had enough of that. Radio is an idea whose time has come in this community, and he intended to see it through. The people who sat around that table were probably terrified, and even as I sat there, okay. I was skeptical. And here this man, this, he was a born organizer, could put together, and he always said to people, it is us, we as a group, as a people, what we owe society, how can we be, how can we, take our place on the world stage. This is one mm -hmm. of the ways that we can do that using this radio station. Okay. But because people had been burned so many times, they tried to have a credit union, grocery store, I don't know what else. And so now here comes a guy that's really a nut. And he's talking about if we fail in this, we'll have to live with it the rest of our lives. But I had the words integrity, yes. drive, vision, passion, and a sense of justice. And Let's just focus on KBBG, KBBG's past, its present, and then what we see in the future. And when I talk about the past, we've got Jimmy Porter's story and the passion that led him to actually found this station. Uh, and we've kind of talked a little bit about, you know, Cottage Street without letting people know. Can you just give us a past history as best you can, you know, in terms of KBBG FM radio. The there is a timeline and a, and a time frame in which all of this happened. Um, the radio station it, itself, it took us a year. The people who were involved took a year for us to find out what we were supposed to do. Uh, there was a gentleman back at that time by the name of uh, Charles Knox who was uh, very instrumental in writing grants. Um, Jimmy, through his community enabler, was able to move the whole idea forward because of, of his, in, his integrity. Uh, people believed in what Jimmy was, was trying to accomplish. And even though we may have been a little reluctant, we said, mm -hmm. we're going to get on board and, and see what will happen. The greatest thing that happened during that period was the kind of growing up it was kind of coming together. It was the community and Jimmy's vision working hand in hand. And that had never really been done before. He was able, in spite of people who might have had differences or whatever, they came on board and started with 10 watts of power. And you couldn't even hear us, I don't think, in Cedar Falls or just maybe at the edge of Cedar Falls. Went on later to become a 10,000 watt radio station. So you're saying that Jimmy, another word we should add would be selfless. He was selfless Absolutely. in this because uh, the issue of social justice was larger than he was. Right. And so when you say we, you're speaking of people in general. All of that was part of Jimmy's being an organizer, 
of Jimmy being able to see the big picture of Jimmy working toward every day of his life, how can we empower ourselves? Not only benefit us, it will benefit our children, it will benefit our society, it will benefit the nation. The task for Jimmy was to be able to uh, actually convince people that this was something that could be done. He was a clear thinker because if at eight years old you know what you need are three square meals a day and an education mm -hmm. in order to get ahead, that particular awareness of needs and situations just kind of followed him right to his adult life here. Yes. So the past was the struggle mm -hmm. to actually get the community mm -hmm. to get on board yes. with this particular idea and then to find the people mm -hmm. who could help him do this through grant writing, mm -hmm. et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, overcoming the notion that this will never work. I think it was in 77 when the radio station ultimately was able to get incorporated as a nonprofit, I think, Afro-American Community Broadcasting, Inc. It was established in 1977, that's AACB, mm -hmm. March 1st, 1977. Yes. Got your 501c3 mm -hmm. approval to be a nonprofit, okay, yes. to continue on Jimmy's effort to communicate, to educate through uh, public affairs programming and also through the Minority Communications Training Institute mm -hmm. that was established. So this little kernel of an idea that lured you almost from uh, Washington, D.C. to Waterloo, in front of your very eyes were, was really coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. You could see this little kernel actually turning into a whole piece of popcorn yes. right yes. in front of your very eyes. And there will be people that too many to name, but uh, that uh, they know who they are, uh, who really saw and internalized that, yes, we, we can do this. We, mm -hmm. we really can do this. And I think the fact that we're sitting here today, and, and as you said mm -hmm. earlier on, sitting in the boardroom of KBBG, that his vision was correct. Mm -hmm. But Jimmy never wanted us to stop growing. He never wanted us uh, to stop um, uh, trying to get our youth to be involved for, for training and for moving ahead uh, in, in their educational life. Um, those were things that he held so dearly. And it's going from Cottage Street to Newell Street. Yes. Okay, now you said that the enabler was initially supported by the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, mm -hmm. maybe the Catholic Church. And later the Catholic the Church, Catholic yes. The Catholic Church came mm -hmm. in. And then, of course, to make this move and to continue on, uh, when did you guys first went on air then from Cottage Street in 78, I guess? Mm -hmm. you know? uh, July 26. And, you know, we don't want to uh, leave out our, our churches and our, our, our black community uh, who had uh, been supportive uh, mm -hmm. over the years. Um, they were happy that now they had a, another medium that they could, yeah. uh, that they could uh, talk to people. Yeah. and, and uh, about whatever the church mm -hmm. was doing or mm -hmm. plans that they were having that had to do with how well our community, how, how well it would be, how healthy it would be. I mean, we had all kinds of issues then mm -hmm. as we do now. Yeah. Let's move to the present. I mean, we're off Cottage Street now. Uh, we went on the air, mm -hmm. okay? We maintained. Uh, and the black churches and people in the community stepped up to continue to support KBBG. I said mm -hmm. it was non-commercial. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about being non-commercial. What are the struggles there? Being non-commercial is a struggle. However, um, we had the sense to know that we would not be dealt with on the same level as a commercial station or even as a white station. And in, in terms of... of um, ads in terms mm -hmm. of, of uh, um, being able to solicit at mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. level that mm -hmm. others, we knew mm -hmm. that others were being um, invested in and mm -hmm. advertising was going on. Uh, so it has always been, it's always been a struggle. Porter saw for this station being uh, so significant for the black community, uh, did that voice at some times become a threat? For the white community? Some, yes, there would have been, the, at least they knew there was the possibility okay. of a threat. At the same time, though, 
by what we, what we did, not by what we said, the community began to realize that what Jimmy was saying, he was looking for bringing people together, using the radio station to bring people together, not to separate them. He mm -hmm. would say that river is what separates east and west. We can do something mm -hmm. to, to eliminate that. We were being inclusive. The same thing we've been saying all along, saying to them, we need to be included. We want to be inclusive. We want you to have a voice because we know what it is not to have a voice. You have had the monopoly on having a voice for all of these years on everything that is media. Mm -hmm. You've written the stories the way you want them. You know, whatever it is that portrays us as who we are not, you had the power to make that happen. And now we need to turn that whole thing around by bringing sometimes the very people who were on the other side, yeah. who are now supporters. But it has taken, it's been a long, hard road. Would you like to say anything as we wind up and conclude our first conversation? <laughs> we will continue on the road that we started out on, communicate to educate. Our, our mission is to bring uh, people together okay. and to, uh, have the kind of information and programming that goes out over these airwaves that will enable people. Okay. Um, that is the, the whole reason for the station c uh, coming into being. That, I know that that was Jimmy's vision and mine as well. Uh, we shared a passion for what we were involved in right. and continue to, to carry on and we hope that there will be those right. that will um, help us to do that. Well, I tell you, Lou, from the, the coercing that you and Jimmy did to get me on the radio, and now I'm sitting here talking to you, uh, I would like to say that uh, as we go into the future, and as I've watched the station struggle to survive, that any time is the right time for people to support KBBG radio stations so that you can continue to communicate, to educate. And I want to thank you for letting me talk with you today. And thank you very much.